for our text this evening. Please turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 15. And we will be looking at that verses 1 to 11. John chapter 15 verses 1 to 11. I am the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. Now let's come to prayer. Let us ask God to be our helper as we look at this verse. Pray that he will be our teacher. And that we will rightly apply what this verse is saying to us. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we come to you. And we come, O oh Lord, because we know that we need you desperately. There is, O oh Lord, nothing good in us. In our flesh dwells no good thing. It is the Spirit that gives life. Lord, there is nothing in us to commend us before you apart from your work in us. Apart from, O oh Lord, the perfect righteousness of Christ. Apart from, O oh Lord, your saving work. Truly, we need you, Father. We plead that you would, in your mercy, in, Lord, looking upon the perfect sacrifice of Christ, you would pour out your blessing upon your people. The grace, O oh Lord, that has been purchased by Christ on Calvary's cross. May truly the Savior see the fruit of his death 
and the grace that shall be seen in the lives of your people. Even as he offered himself as a sacrifice for sin, may he see the fruits of his death in your saving work, in bringing more and more the kingdom, your kingdom, into the lives and the hearts of your people. And even, O oh Lord, in this dark, world. Be with us, guide us, aid us. We pray that our study of your word might be united with faith and that you would use it, O oh Lord, for the progress of your kingdom in our lives, for the praise and honor of your name. Be with us, be played in Jesus' name. Amen. Later, when we look at the context of the words of Christ here in John 15, perhaps the closest experience that we could probably experience that is similar to what they felt and we will look at the context later on is that when we have a good or her hear a good sermon or perhaps is blessed at the reading of the word joy fills our hearts we feel we know we see again our champion going before us. The victor who will bring victory for all his people. And we feel the joy. We feel that blessedness that our champion is with us. And then Monday, we wake up in the morning and the closeness of Christ that we felt is not there. And we see the prospect of living the Christian life, the life which Spurgeon says is like a candle burning in the midst of an ocean. Impossible to live. The fight that we have to fight. In the midst of sin. And because our Savior is. Seem to be nowhere to be found. We tremble. At the thought. Despondent, you will feel you will never win this day. That's the closest that I can think of that the apostles felt when Christ said these words to them. Looking at the text again in John 15, note the time when these words were spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're told that it was this was spoken at the very night in which Christ would be betrayed. These words of Christ are part of the farewell discourse that he gave to his disciples prior to his death. This begins in John chapter 13 to the end of chapter 17 where the Lord 
closes his discourse with his high priestly prayer to the Father. In this discourse, Christ was plainly speaking that he was now going back to the Father and that for a moment they cannot follow him. In John chapter 13 and verse 38, In John chapter 13, and verse 38. Or, sorry, in verse 36. Oh, sorry, go back some more. In verse 15. By this all men will know that you are my disciple, if you have love for one another. And 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go. You cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will crow until, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. It was very plain from the lips of the Savior, and he was making it very clear to the disciple that he was going away. The time of his death has come. And he was now going back to the Father, also in chapter 14, verse 2. We find these plain words of the Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. He was going away. He was now going back to the Father, and so therefore the disciples will not see the Savior for a time. They cannot follow him. The times that they have enjoyed in fellowship with Christ, the leadership of Christ, the admonitions of Christ, the guidance of Christ. The apostles will not to enjoy that for a time. And therefore, we find that the frame of the hearts of these disciples were troubled. They were troubled. In verse 14, or in chapter 14, in verse 1, Christ says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Why were these disciples troubled? Because they knew that Christ was leaving them. He was going to a place where they could not follow. In verse 27 also of John 14, John 14, 27, we find at what state the disciples were at this time. In verse 27, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Not as the word gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. 
The disciples were troubled. They knew that Christ was going. And their hearts were fearful and troubled. In chapter 16, also going forward in John chapter 16. And verse 1. In John chapter 16, I'm sorry, in verse 6. Again, this is made clear. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. What, did, what was Christ saying? In verse 5, But now I am going to him who sent me. And now none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. That was the state of the heart of the disciples of Christ when these words were spoken to him. No doubt the disciples have known the joy of knowing and having Christ. They have long waited for the champion of God's people who will come to save them from their enemies, to save them from the bondage of sin, to give them victory over death, over sin, over the devil. And they enjoyed being with him, following his guidance, seeing his compassion, they enjoyed that the Holy One of God is actually dwelling among them. Sinner though they be, the Son of God, the Holy One of God, dwells with sinful man. And he was not coming crushing the heads of, this, of yet the imperfect disciple. He was kind. He was gentle. He did not just dwell with the righteous. And of course, no one is righteous. But he came for the sick. For those that are sick in the, in the soul. To those who need healing, spiritual healing. Christ came to redeem. He did not come to judge but to save. And therefore, the disciples truly enjoyed his company. Here is the champion. We can never save ourselves. We can never really make ourselves acceptable to God. But the Savior is here. He will bring us to glory. He will give us Liberty. They had his joy. And yet now, Christ was saying he was going away. What a daunting idea. And think also of the task that Christ was leaving the disciples. He trained the apostles to preach the gospel. How are they going to do that? Where will, we, where will they get the strength to fight against the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were persecuting them, throwing them out of the synagogue? How can they fight? How can they bear the load that the whole world was against the message of the gospel? And therefore the prospect that Christ was leaving them troubled them greatly. A sense of despondency 
a sense of we will never make it. If he goes, we will never make it. The sense of foreboding, the prospect of utter failure and defeat. Now this was the frame of the disciples when Christ spoke this word. And therefore what the Lord is doing in the context of the word that Christ said, these words that we have read, was to encourage the disciples. These are words to encourage and to admonish. And this is made very clear that the words of Christ spoken here was primarily for the purpose to encourage them. In chapter 15 and verse 11. In verse 11 of our text, Christ says, These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Despondent, heavy of heart, with the prospect of the impossibility of the task, if Christ is not with them. Christ encouraged them. Christ speaks words of comfort and encouragement. That my joy, the joy that you enjoy, the joy that you have in me might be with you. And some translators would even say, will remain with you. They have enjoyed it once. And there is the prospect that it will be disturbed, the joy that they have in Christ Jesus. There is the prospect that it will be shaken. And taken away. And Christ said these words. In order to. That the joy. Of the Lord. Might remain. In them. I am saying these things to you. So that my joy. My joy may be in you. This is not the joy. Of giddiness. This is not the joy that is so shallow. This is not the joy that is produced by the flesh or earthly joys. It is the joy of Christ. The joy that he brings. Freedom from sin. The taking away of the judgment of the Father. The sinner reconciled to the Holy God. The guidance of Christ. The leadership of Christ. Hiding in his wing. When all of the enemies could not rebut the Savior. And there was nothing that the Lord could not do. Waves, silence, devils, are subject to him. They could do anything with the Lord. But now the prospect is foreboding. And that's why the Lord says, I am saying these things to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. And therefore, let's look at the words of encouragement that the Lord gave. That was the purpose for his words. And therefore, when we look at the verses in verse 1 to 11, we have that primary 
That is the primary thing that we are looking for. That these words were meant to encourage them. And what was what were these words? They were words. Truth. He spoke to them words of truth. Now before going to the words of truth, let me just give a word of application at this point. But here is an important principle that all of us Christians should, should fully understand. Fear, fretting, fretting, fear, a sense of foreboding. We should try to replace it with the joy of the Lord. Fear paralyzes. Fear, fretting, lead to sin. And therefore, we must replace fear and fretting with the joy that comes from Christ. The joy of the Lord, we are told in Nehemiah 8 and verse 10. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And therefore, if there is not that joy in our hearts, but fear and fretting and a sense of foreboding, we will never win the fight. We must seek to replace the Fear and fretting and foreboding with the joy of Christ. Oh, not the giddiness of the world, not the funfair, but the joy of Christ. So how did Christ encourage them? How did Christ encourage them? Well, how does Christ seek to change the sense of foreboding with the joy of Christ. Well, I've said it again. I've said it before. I'll say it again. He spoke to them words of truth. He spoke to them words of truth. Not too many words are not really valuable. Ah, these are just words. But note what Christ did to replace that sense of foreboding with the joy of God. He spoke words of truth. And again, this should give us a significant principle that the way, that the way to quiet our fear, a sense of defeat and foreboding, is to listen to the words of Christ. To believingly listen to the words and the truth that comes from the lips of the Savior. And what truth did Christ particularly spoke of? Well, in verse 1, he tells us that he is the true vine. I am the true vine. Now the vine was used by God as an emblem for Israel's life in the Old Testament. And this is clear from several texts from Scripture. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 1. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 1. Let me, let me sing now for my well-beloved a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with 
the choicest vine. And he built a tower in the middle of it. And he, and he hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. And now, o inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done? Why then, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now, let me tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned or hold, but briars and thorns will come out. This is the picture of Israel. God speaks of the nation of Israel as his vine, his vineyard, planted for the purpose that it might produce good fruit, but it only produced bad ones. We also find this emblem that God used this picture of a, of a vine or a vineyard to speak of Israel in Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 1. Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 1. In that day the Lord will punish Leviathan the fleeting serpent with his fierce and great and mighty sword, even Leviathan, the twisted serpent. And he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. In that day a vineyard of wine, sing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. I water it every moment so that no one will damage it. I guard it night and day. I have no wrath. Should someone give me briars and thorns in battle, then I would step on them. I would burn them completely. Or let me, or let him rely on my protection and let him make peace with me. Let him make peace with me. In the days to come, Jacob will take root. Israel will blossom and sprout. And they will fill the whole world with truth. And again, we find here, Israel depicted as the vine or a vineyard. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 21. And there's so many. And we'll just have to limit ourselves. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 21. Again, God speaking, when I planted you a choice vine, a completely fruitful seed, how then have you turned yourself before me into the degenerate shoot of a foreign vine? Although you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your iniquities before me, declares the Lord God. How can, how can you say I am not? Again, again here the Lord speaks. I have planted you a choice vine, a completely fruitful seed. How then have you turned yourself before me into a degenerate seed of a foreign vine? This is the picture that God often used to the people of Israel, the old covenant people of God under the old covenant. And we are told by scholars that this became, this vine actually became a symbol of the life of Israel, particularly during the time of Christ. The vine was minted in the coin during the Maccabean era to represent the life of Israel. 
And others would say that there was a golden vine in the temple that Herod built as a representative of the life of Israel. And therefore, there is an almost undeniable re reference to Christ's word to this. Christ was contrasting himself with the old Israel who did not bear fruit for God. And that he, the true vine, is the one who will fulfill the Father's purpose of fruitfulness. Well, the old covenant people of God was a vine, and yet it produced only bad fruit, where it did not produce the fruit that the Lord wanted. Christ was the true vine who will fulfill where Israel failed the fruit that God was looking for. And this is something which we have read already in Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 6. Something that was prophesied even under the old covenant. In Jeremiah chapter 2, or is it in Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 6? We've read it earlier. In the days to come, Jacob will take root, Israel will blossom and sprout, and they will fill the whole world with fruit. Also in Psalm in ch Psalm chapter eighty Psalm chapter eighty and verse fourteen. We will not do an exposition, but a clear reference to this is it's a prophecy of what the Son of Man will do when he comes. O God of hosts, turn again now, we beseech you. Psalm 80 and verse 14. Look down from heaven and see and take care of this vine, even the suit which your right hand is planted, and on the Son whom you have strengthened for yourself. It is burned with fire, it is cut down, they perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the Son of Man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Revive us. And we will call upon your name, O Lord God of hosts. Restore us. Where Israel failed as the vine, as the vineyard, the Son of Man will fulfill. He is the true vine. The one that will truly produce the fruit that God is looking for. Well, the old covenant people of God, Israel of old, only produce bad fruit. It never really produced the fruit that God purposed it to be. That God was calling it to produce. The Son of Man will produce it. And what words of encouragement 
this would have been to the disciples. What words of encouragement this would have been to the disciples. If one is truly looking at and what the thing that God was really teaching the people of Israel under the old covenant. The repeated failures upon failures is that they need Messiah. You read the Old Testament when God gave the laws to Moses. God already said, Israel will fail. You will not be able to do what I command you. This nation will fail. And he was teaching them that they need Messiah. In the figures of in the figures of the sacrifices. And during the time of the judges, what was the repeated frame? What is the repeated theme of the book of Judges? The degeneracy of Israel. You read its preface. It only says, and Israel became worse than they were at first. A cycle of difficulties, and therefore in their difficulties they will cry to the Lord for help. And then when there was peace, back to the same old sin, and not just back to the same old sin, back to a deeper form of sin, a more degenerate state of sin, that when you read the book of Judges, it depresses your heart. And what was God's message in sending the judges to help God's people? They need a deliverer. That was the picture that God was painting in the book of Judges. They need someone who will be born from Israel that will champion the cause of God. Many of the so-called repentance of Israel in the book of Judges were but superficial repentance. But these were pictures Of what God will do. What Messiah will do. The degeneracy of the people. The unfruitfulness of the vine of God. Messiah will fulfill its true purpose. He is the true vine. The vine that will produce the fruit that God is looking for. What a great comfort this would be to the disciples. The history of Israel is always failure. Failure upon failure upon failure. Until God has to drive them away from the land. And now again, given God's favor in bringing them back. To the land again, Israel was not in a shape that would produce the fruit of God. The leadership of Israel were just a bunch of hypocrites. White was tomb. And therefore, Knowing as what we often see in, in, in the Bible, are we better than our fathers? That would have been the words of the disciples. Are we any better than our fathers? Are we going now, we being by ourselves, going to produce the truth that Israel has never produced throughout the years? Will we be able to produce that fruit that 
God truly desires? Are we better than our fathers? When Christ was there, they were rejoicing. Here is the champion. Here is the one promise who will give us the fruitfulness that he is leaving us. He will go to a place where we can follow. Therefore, when the words of Christ said, No, this vine will not be like Israel. I am the true vine. This will not be another failure. The New Testament community, the New Covenant community that Christ formed will not be the same as the Old Covenant Israel. It will produce the fruit that God desires. Christ is the source of this life. He is the true vine who will produce the fruit that God desires. And therefore, what an encouraging word this is to the disciples. This will not be another repetitive story like the Old Testament stories, the failures of Israel, the judgment of God upon Israel. Messiah has come. And Christ said, I am the true vine. Words of truth spoken to the disciples. Another word of truth that Christ spoke to them is that they are the branches. Branches who have already received the initial cleansing or pruning and therefore are destined for much fruitfulness. Going back to our text in John chapter 15 and verse 5. Let's read starting from verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Listen to what Christ says in verse 3. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Now, the word here, clean, is the same word that is also used here in in verse 2. Where it says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. The word prunes there is the same family of words. In verse 3, you are already clean. The word prune and clean are in the same family of words. So the word prune there in verse 2 can also mean every branch that bears fruit he cleans so that it may bear more fruit. So the idea here is that his disciples have received the initial cleaning. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. The initial pruning. And therefore, God will continue to prune that they will bear much fruit. 
Note that Christ says that there are those branches who does not bear fruit. Branches that the Father, the vine dresser, will take away. But this is not true to the disciples. And Christ was speaking words of encouragement to them. You have already received the initial cleansing. You are already clean. Because of the word that I have spoken to you. Now, we remember right away what Christ said in chapter 13 of John. When he said, when he was cleaning the feet of the disciples. And when he was about to clean the feet of Peter, Peter said, Never shall you clean my feet. And Christ says, If I do not clean your feet, you have no part of me. And Peter said, Oh, then, then, not only my feet, but my head, my hand. And Christ says, Those who are clean no, no longer need a bath. And you are clean, but not all of you. And what he means by that was that Judas who was going to betray him was that branch that is unclean. The branch that God will take away. And actually, Judas has left. He had some kind of a connection with Christ. He had some kind of closeness with Christ. But there was no vital root. Judas was not vitally connected to Christ. He was that branch that the Father will take away and burn in the fire. But for the disciples who remain, Christ said, you are already clean because of the word. You have already been cleansed. And therefore, this assures you that the Father will continue on pruning. That you might bear much more fruit. He tells them that they are branches. And that they have received the initial cleansing. And because they have received the initial cleansing, the vine dresser, the father, will continue and make sure that they are cleansed and pruned. That they will bear much. But the father's care. And that would have been truly a comfort to the disciples. God was going to prune them. Having already received the initial cleansing. And some would say that this initial cleansing is justification by faith. Of course the word, Christ says, because of the word that I have spoken to you. The words that they have received by faith. And therefore this is justification. Others would say that this is definitive sanctification. That initial break with sin. The sinner dies to sin as he is united to Christ. The initial cleansing. I don't think we need to categorize that this is just justification, that this is just definitive sanct sanctification begun. The initial dying to sin by the sinner when he comes to Christ, being buried with him, being raised to a new life. I don't think we have to make a distinction whether this is justification or definition. I believe it's the whole package. 
There is that initial cleansing when the person comes to Christ. He is washed of his sin. He is justified. He is declared righteous before God. And he also receives. And he also dies to sin. And is made alive to God. Romans chapter 6. We will not go there. But this is the initial cleansing. And, and, and Christ was telling them, since you, have you are already clean, and since you have received that initial cleansing, forgiveness of sin, the gift of the Spirit when you believe, cleansing your hearts, that they are now called saints, sanctified ones. We can be sure of greater fruitfulness. The Father will see to it that they bear much fruit. The promise of prayers that Christ gave also. the promised prayers in verse 7b. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be given to you. We must not think of this as that God is going to give us whatever we wish, even things that will harm us. What father will give a child something that the father knows will harm his child. And that's the importance of the word. If you abide in my word, if the word, if my word were dwelling richly in your heart, and the things that you will pray for are things that are in accord with the will of God the revelation of God and the things that God reveals, He will not withhold if you ask according to His will. It shall be done for you. So what the word of encouragement this would be, that they have experienced The new birth. They have received forgiveness of sin. The initial cleansing. And therefore they are assured. Of much fruitfulness. The vine dresser. The father. Will see to it that they are pruned. That they might bear much fruit. And they are given. A promise. But their prayers will be heard. The fight is too much to bear. The desire to be faithful to God, the desire to live a holy life, ask and God will not give it. Possible. The assurance, not only that the that the father is the vine dresser will prune, the assurance of that their prayers will be heard, and then there is an added incentive that they will surely progress in their sanctity, having received the initial. Cleansing. That they will bear much fruit. is because by much fruit, the Father is glorified. Mm -hmm. 
Verse 8. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and I it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, so prove to be my disciple. God will not withhold fruitfulness of his people. The fruitfulness that leads to a greater proof of their discipleship. Because these things glorify the Father. So why would he withhold that which glorifies his name? A sense of foreboding. Christ encourages them. So here Christ speaks a word of encouragement. And how does he do that? He does it by speaking words of truth. But not only by speaking words of truth that he encourages his disciples... He also gave words of admonition. Words of admonition. Listen to the words of Christ. Abide in me. Abide in my love. These are words of admonition. Words that call for action. If my word abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. So Christ does not only encourage his disciples. Christ does not only replace their sense of foreboding with the sense of joy in him by Speaking to them words of truth, he also speaks words of admonition, words that calls for action. The truth heard must be acted upon by faith. The truths that they have heard must be acted upon by faith. If it is to truly make their joy full. And what words of admonition did Christ give to his disciples? Well, here is the main thing that he keeps repeating and repeating. Abide in me or remain in me. Verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7. And I think there's the word abide is repeated 10 times in these 11 verses. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. That is the call of Christ to his disciples. Not just words of truth. I am the vine. Not just that you are already clean. And therefore you... Your destiny is that you will be fruitful. Having received the initial cleansing, the Father will keep pruning. God will not withhold what you pray for. God will certainly give that which glorifies Him. Now he speaks words of admonition. This is what you are to do in the light of the truth that I have said. Abide in me. Now, the disciples were correct in feeling hopeless and helpless with the prospect that Christ was leaving them. Were they correct? 
that sense of foreboding? And did Christ tell them, don't be sad, it's okay if I go, you can do it on your own. You don't need me. I've already taught you so many things. I have, you have already gained wisdom in the three years that you have been going around with me. I have explained to you the words. I have given you principles. I have thought, I have taught you, you have one another, you have Peter, you have this apostle, you have this and that. So don't be sad if I go. You have more than enough to fight the battle. You have more than enough to bear fruit that is truly pleasing to God. Did Christ say that? No. As a matter of fact, Christ confirms. You need me. You can't make it without me. Isn't that what Christ keeps saying in these verses? Apart from me, you can do nothing. I am the true vine. And if someone is detached, if someone is detached, it withers apart from you. The branch that is detached from the vine can never bear fruit. He says, you need me. You're right. That you cannot do without me. No matter how many principles of the world I have already told you. No matter how much of the Bible. You already understand. You still need me. You cannot do without me. Christ did not say, well, you have this apostle, you, know, you have this pastor, you have, well, you have this church. That's all you need. You don't need Christ anymore. You don't need me. No. As a matter of fact, Christ says the very opposite. He says, only in me will you bear fruit. I am the true vine. Any other vine any other source of strength, any other source of life that you will seek to attach yourself will never produce the fruit that God desires. You need the Savior. So in that sense, the apostles were right. They could not look at one another. Ah, never mind, I have this brother. I have this pastor. I don't need Christ. I have this church, very strong. I have my devotions. Christ tells them, no, no, you are correct in feeling that apart from me, you can do nothing. No matter how many Bible verses that you have read. No matter how many leadership training that you have learned. And these disciples were with the, was with the best. They were with the, with the best, the Savior himself. And yet, Christ says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You are correct in feeling that apart from me, you can do nothing. But what the disciples were wrong about, they were not wrong in feeling that they cannot proceed without Christ. They were right in that. And Christ confirmed. But what the disciples were wrong about is that physical, the physical absence of Christ meant that Christ will no longer be with them. 
That's where they were wrong. That because they could no longer see Him, they could no longer touch Him, they could not anymore hear His vocal cords speaking to them or see Him and therefore Christ is not anymore with them. His physical absence to them meant that Christ was no longer with them. And therefore Christ reminds them. He tells them, there is a way of being with me. And that's why he calls them, abide in me. Remain with me. Even without his physical presence, And even where his physical presence could not actually give, there is a union and communion with Christ that is far more deeper in the bonds of faith. Judas Judas had Christ. He heard him. He touched him. He went about with Christ's physical presence. But the union that Christ was saying that there is a way where you can truly be with me that does not involve my physical presence. And this is the union that is truly vital. A union and communion with Christ in the bonds of living faith. And that's where you and me enter sin. In the language of other spiritual truth, this is the presence of Christ in us. By the Holy Spirit. And this presence and communion is made tangible to us by and through His Word. And this is made very clear. For example, in the verse that says, that the the, the instrument of the initial cleansing that was the word that Christ spoke to them. What gave them that initial cleansing? What gave them that vital union to the vine? You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. That is what makes them united. The the tangible way in which we can be united to Christ is His Word. His teaching. The precepts that He told us. This is true in their initial times. In the word of Christ was the, is the instruments is the instrument that initially cleansed them. And then they receive it by faith. And then also in what Christ said that the Father will prune. And again, I say that the word prune is actually the same word as the word cleanse. What was what is the instrument that God used in the pruning of his people? Now a lot of people say, many, many commentators say 
that it is trials. And that's why the figure of the pruning means it's it's cut, it's painful. But I go along with Calvin, who says that it is God's work. Because what is trial without the word of God? Isn't it an occasion for only for stumbling? Isn't it an occasion only to become bitter with God? Unless it is the word that guides us. So the instrument of pruning. Yes, the Bible says that trials are a means that God uses to sanctify his. But what is the word? What is trial without the word? It is only an occasion for stumbling, an occasion, a temptation for sin. Unless it is guided by the word. It is what defines, it is what teaches us. The occasion of the trial is there and God uses it. But it is the word that teaches us. It is the word that purifies. Even as Christ says in John chapter 17 and verse 17, Sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is true. Remember Hebrews chapter 12? Hebrews chapter 12. Where the writer speaks of the discipline of the Lord. Now this discipline here in Hebrews chapter 12. The discipline here in Hebrews chapter 12. Is clearly trials. The Hebrews. Who believed in Christ were being persecuted. And, and they are told in Hebrews ch chapter 12 that you keep on going. You have not even resisted to the point of death. And he tells them in verse 4. You have not yet resisted to the point of death. To the point of shedding blood. In your striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more rather be subject to the fathers of spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time and seem best to them, but he disciplines us for a good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful yet to those who have been trained by it. Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lay may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Trials. Difficulties can either break the lame feet or heal it. And what makes the difference? The Word of God. Do not 
regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. He puts upon them the right attitude towards trial. And he uses God's word in order that they might profit. So what is the main instrument in the cleansing? The trial is but the occasion. But it is the word that cleanses the heart. Because the trial can either break the lame feet or give it healing. So that's why the most tangible thing that we can hold when it comes to communion and our union with Christ. Is the word. We hide his word in our heart. We fellowship with God by his word. We can never have true fellowship with Christ and it unless it is through his word. Now of course it is the spirit. Because words can be dead without the Spirit. But we can never have true fellowship unless we are guided by the Word. Who is Christ? How does He treat? How, how is He? How will He respond? What does Christ truly desire? Where do you find it? How do you know? Christ, apart from his word, you won't. The mystic's dream of a bee. But Christ reveals himself in the word. And therefore, we can have communion with Christ. Christ can be near. We can have that abiding in Christ. We can have that fellowship with Christ. We can know that Christ is with us through the Word and by His. Therefore, the word of admonition. When faced with a foreboding, feeling that the, the, the sense of joy that Christ is with us can only be fed by a believing Fellowship with the Word. Yes, Christ was no longer physically present with the disciples. But they have that union which is far better than the physical presence of Christ. The fellowship in His Word. Union with Christ through the bonds of faith in response to his word. And therefore the admonition, abide in me. Yes, you will never make it. Fighting alone. No matter how many biblical principles you have imbibed. No matter how many strong brethren you have in the church. But 
abide in Christ. That is where true fruitfulness comes. And of course, by implication, we can say that anything that is not really of Christ, anything, the only fruit that really matters are those that come from the true vine. The only thing that truly matters, the only fruit that truly matters with God is those that are born out from our union and communion with Christ. Anything else are simply barren and dead. Activities here, activities here. Run here and run there. Remember the church in Laodicea? They have a reputation. I am rich. I need of nothing. Christ says you don't know that you're blind. You're naked. Buy from me gold. I saw. There are many things which we can do that does not really come from Christ. When Christ says you can do nothing, he doesn't mean to say that we are immobile. There are many things that we can do. And even the service that we, uh, we can even do things that are in the name of service to Christ. But the only thing that matters is the service that comes out from our union and communion with Christ. You remember Martha and Mary? Do you remember? Do you understand the, the difficult saying of Christ? When Martha came and says, Why do you leave my sister? Why do you allow my sister to just sit there and listen to your word and I am left to do all the work in seeking to serve you and your disciples. And what did Christ say? The enigmatic word of Christ. One thing is truly necessary, needful. And it will not be taken away from Mary. She sat at the feet of the Savior. Listening to his word. The fruit that truly matters with God are those that come out, out of our union and communion with Christ. Because we can, we can do things, service as it were. Christ says we can do nothing, does it mean immobility? But true fruits that truly matter to God can only truly come from our union and communion. With Christ. And therefore, the exhortation abide. Abide in me. And then there's another exhortation. In the word of Christ, abide in my love. John 15 and verse 9. And here I will only deal very quickly. Do not, <clears throat> Christ says in John 15, verse 9.
Just as my Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. What is Christ saying? Do not let yourself be cut off from the love of Christ. Do not. Do not allow yourself to be cut off from the love of Christ. Where you do not follow him. Where you are stubbornly going away from him. When you refuse to have fellowship with him. When you refuse to spend time in communion with him. Again, the words of Christ to the Laodiceans. Towards the end, he says, If anyone, behold, I knock at the door. If anyone opens, I will come in and sup with him. He said that to the Laodiceans. That is not a verse primarily given to unbelievers. It is a word to a church that are so filled with their own activities and think that they are rich in the eyes of God and that they need nothing. They can do it on their own. But they have shut the door of fellowship with Christ. And Christ therefore tells them, if anyone here, behold, I am knocking at the door. If anyone opens, I will come in and sit and sup with him. That is a picture of my friend of fellowship, of communion, of being with Christ. Spending time, like Mary, spending time in fellowship with because only the fruit that comes out from our union and communion with Christ is the fruit that truly matters. Abide in Christ. Abide in His love. Do not let yourself be cut off. And how do you do it? By lovingly keeping his commandments. Now a lot of people says is allergic when they say keeping his commandments. But surely Christ is not speaking of the legalistic keeping of the law. He is not speaking about this, the dry, burdensome, legalistic keeping of the law. It is the Keeping of the law out of love for him. He already loves. And therefore you remain in that love. You know he loves you. Abide in that love. Keep his word. He lovingly keep his commandments. And besides keeping the commandments that is not out of love is not really keeping it because what is the sum of the commandment love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself therefore when we face ourselves with a prospect when we do not feel the joy of Christ, when we seem dry and barren and do not know the love of Christ in our hearts, the joy of God's salvation. That's what Robert Morris says in his book. You are in danger that you will seek other lovers. If you are not satisfied and you are not basking in the love of Christ, 
You're putting yourself in temptation for other lovers. And therefore, abide in Christ. In the morning when you wake up, oh, seek his face. Now we do not make a law that it Devotional time should be this. How long this should be done here. Spend time. And not just a cursory reading. I've done what I've done one chapter, that's it. Long for the presence of Christ. Long that your soul be expanded knowing the love of Christ. Fill yourself with the truth of the words of Christ. And then you can say, whatever my love, it is well with my soul. O oh Lord, if you are near, I will not fear the battle. I will not fear the battle if you are by my side. And this is not mysticism. Paul said this when he was under trial in Rome. He says, all abandon me. But the Lord was with me. Now let us seek that presence of Christ. Remain in him that we might bear much fruit for God. Let me give a word of warning very quickly to those who are yet outside of Christ. Remember Judas. He had some connection with Christ. And perhaps you, you have some connection. You certainly are hearing the word of Christ. But unless you join to him with the bonds of faith, you will be a branch that shall be taken and thrown into the fire. Burn in the judgment of God's wrath. Therefore, go to Christ. Do not be satisfied with the mere superficial knowledge of Christ. Go to him. And you will not find a Savior who will resist you. He calls you. He invites you. He tells you, come. And I will give you rest. Do not be satisfied with the superficial relationship. Oh, I attend this church. Oh, I read my Bible. Have that vital union in the bonds of faith.